through this Christmas season and into the new year, we've been focusing on this one word, this one idea, that there was an arrival. That Jesus arrived, that, that God Almighty came into human history and God arrived, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the first arrival. But then we also talked about how then, wait a minute, when we put our faith in Jesus, that same Jesus arrives and moves into us. He arrives again in our lives. And if you're not yet a Christian and you put your faith in Jesus, he will move in. He will arrive. He'll be part of your life. But God's arrival doesn't just, you know, it, it starts in Bethlehem. It continues in our lives. But here's the beauty of it. Everywhere we go, if you're a Christian, if you're following Jesus, he lives inside of you. Everywhere you go, God arrives with you. And when God arrives, we've learned through this Christmas season, when he arrives, holiness arrives. Jesus came as holiness. He enters and brings his holiness to us and changes us, and we walk with holiness into our world. His truth, he came as the truth. His truth lives in us. We bring his truth to the world. He came as the hope of the world. He's brought us hope. We bring hope to the world. He came as life. He came as the one who brought life to the world. He gives new life to us, born again, and then we take that life into the world. Today, as we finish the series, we're talking about new beginnings. When Jesus entered human history, a new beginning came. Our God is a God of new beginnings. And what better time to think about this than at the beginning of a new year? And a lot of people like to kind of, at the end of the year, you know, late in December, say, I need to come up with some, you know, some New Year's resolutions, some things I'm going to plan on doing for the coming year. And so I did a little search on this and, and found out that there's a, there's a bunch, of, bunch of different kind of common ones. Here's, here were the top 10 New Year's resolutions. See if that, these sound familiar, okay? Exercise more. Lose weight. Get organized. Number four, learn a new skill or a hobby. People pick, pick, pick something new they want to do. Number five, live life to the fullest. Kind of get more involved and engaged in life. Number six, save more or spend less. Those kind of go hand in hand, right? Number seven, quit a bad habit. And oftentimes smoking is listed there. Number eight, spend more time with family and friends. Great thing to do. Number nine, travel more. Number 10, read more. Now, some of you may have set some really great New Year's resolutions and, you know, Happy New Year, you started the new year, and yesterday you gave up. Okay. I'm done drinking, January 1. Well, maybe just one more. Right? Or I'm, I'm going to start doing this. Well, maybe I'll start on the second or the third. I mean, it's, it, it, it might be over already, but studies show that the time that most people give up on their New Year's resolutions is January 19th. So if you're still in, hanging in there, good job. Uh, but the 19th is coming. Don't give up. You know, but... Sometimes we just go, well, this, here's my new thing I'm going to do. Uh, but God, here's the beauty of the God who came among us as the giver of new beginnings. God can give you a new beginning right now, and right now, and right now, and every now, every moment of every day. If you mess up your resolution, you know, by, by January 4th, you give up and say, well, I'll try again next year. No. If God's leading you to live a different kind of a life, if God is leading you to a new beginning, you can begin today, now, at this moment, and if you trip and stumble and fall, you can get up and start again right there. Don't wait till January 1. Don't wait till a certain date. Just know that God breathes new beginnings into our lives. If you're not sure if God is a God of new beginnings, uh, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, and if you're at home or here on your, on your phone app or on your, in your Bible, go to Genesis 1. Keep your finger there. That's, it's easy to find. It's the first book of the Bible, first chapter of the Bible, first verse of the Bible we're going to look at. And then also go to John chapter 1 and mark that with another finger. So Genesis 1 and John chapter 1, all right? Listen to the words in Genesis chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. The darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. God is creating with beauty, with passion. Now keep your finger there and turn to John chapter 1. And it begins like this. In the beginning. Exact same words. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1. And John's one of the, the four Gospels that begins the New Testament. So the beginning of the Old Testament, in the beginning, beginning of the New Testament, the Gospel of John, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. 
in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. So here's lighting in this new creation. There's a new kind of light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Our God is a God of new beginnings. He is breathing new life into the world, into our lives. So here's my question as we start this new year. Is there a new beginning that you have felt like the Holy Spirit has been nudging you? Okay, it's time to start this new thing. It's time to step into something new. It's time to make a change. Not not a New Year's resolution. A Holy Spirit-led life change, new thing. Stop this, start that, live in a new way. What what is it? I, I hope for all of us one of those things is to say, I want to become more like Jesus. I want to walk more closely with him in this new year and beyond. But begin saying, God, what is it that you want to do in me? And let me tell you, I, 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 there's too many people I've talked to already that are, in the last couple of weeks, are like, oh, no. 2022, more of the same. I've heard that a couple of times, sorry. More of the same. And you know what I can say? Your attitude can be 2022, more of the same, or 2022, more of the same. Because was God on the throne in 2021? What's the answer? That was weak. Okay, let's try that again. Was God on the throne in 2021? Yes. Theologically, we know it was true. Experientially, it may have been a little rough, right? But God is on the throne. Jesus is risen. His church is still here. His people are still following him. Last, last, uh, on on Christmas Eve Sunday, we had 13 people who made a first-time commitment to follow Jesus Christ at Shoreline Church and begin a journey of walking with him. Some would say, praise God. Right? God, the gospel is still true. Lives are still being changed. And so we want to walk in God's ways. So let's talk about how Jesus brings new beginnings. So the incarnation, when Jesus, when Jesus first came, his first arrival, when Jesus came to our world, a new world began. The world is not the same. When Jesus entered human history, the whole world changed. Grace that was not here came upon the human experience. And so we can understand this, that God by nature is about new things. Uh, God by his very nature is a God who's always doing new things, who's always making new things. Our God who breathed and spoke and created the heavens and the earth and the beauty of the world and all and all that we experience. Just, uh, just yesterday morning, Sherry and I uh, took, did a hike together. And if you've never done a hike in the Fort Ord Hills, and if you're able to hike, you got to do it sometime. There's a place to park right along Highway 68. There's all these different trails. Make sure you know where you're going. You, you want to kind of stay on one of the main marked trails. But we, we started by kind of going for the, the parking lot and went up and around. It's kind of all climb, climb, climb to the very highest point. And then there's a bench right there. And we sat down there together. And we prayed together. And we kind of looked out over. And it's just all rolling green hills. And over to the left, you can see. You can see over the hills. You can see the city of Salinas. To the right, you know, over the hills. You know, Monterey's down over there. And it's, it's absolutely silent. You can't hear a thing. You're, you're, you're like, you know, a short distance from Highway 68, but it's just silent. And the beauty, and then there was a lady out there with her binoculars, and I said, what are you looking for? She said, oh, there's this, she said, this burrowing white owl. I said, tell me about it. And she said, well, it's about this big, and it's kind of white and fuzzy with stripes. I said, is it cute? She said, oh, it's really cute. And she had found one. She was looking at one when we first walked by her, and then at the top of the hill, we got talking. And she's describing this thing, And she's out there just with these binoculars looking at the creative beauty of what God has made. And that's one of countless things that are all around us. Our God is creative. And he's made the beauty of this world. And we need to drink it in and recognize who he is. And then Jesus came with a new genesis, with a new beginning. When Jesus came, he said, I will offer a new beginning. In John chapter 3. When Jesus is talking with this this powerful religious leader named Nicodemus, influential, powerful, wealthy, and he says to Nicodemus, oh, and by the way, you need to be born again. Nicodemus, I know you have money. I know you have influence. I know you have power. I know you're on the, the Jewish Supreme Court. I understand who you are, but you need to be born again. A whole new beginning. You know what Nicodemus discovered? He did need a new beginning. And he put his faith in Jesus. But Jesus calls us to new beginnings. If you're a Christian, if you've come to the cross, then he has given you that new beginning already. If you're not a Christian, Jesus' arms are like this saying, hey, 2022, come on, let this be your year. Let this be your time to come and know me, to walk with me. He gives new beginnings. And the question, what new things did Jesus bring? 
When Jesus, when Jesus came, when he arrived as the new beginning, what did he bring into our world? Well, all kinds of stuff. How about, how about these just for a couple of examples? Grace. The grace of heaven came to our world. Undeserved forgiveness and love and care from God Almighty came flowing through Jesus. Intimacy. When Jesus came to this world, he offered intimacy. If you study world religions, and I have, if you study world religions, you'll discover that most religions, in most religions, because they're man-made, in most religions, God is aloof and distant, and there's sort of God out there, and we're over here, and God's not very interested. But in Christianity, God came near. He was born among us as one of us. And that God says, you can be my daughter. And that God says, you can be my son. What? That kind of intimacy? Jesus brought intimacy and connected us with our Father through his life and death and resurrection. <clears throat> when Jesus came, incarnation came. God came among us. So Jesus comes and says, I bring new beginnings. But, but that, you know, in terms of who Jesus is and the theology of, of the incarnation and the cross, it all becomes real when we understand that God came in flesh. God came as a person among us. He came as one of us. And so in John chapter 4, and if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. Jesus has this interaction with this woman. This may be a familiar passage for you. It may be new for some people. But in John chapter 4, Jesus encounters this woman. She's a Samaritan woman. She comes out to a well at high noon. She wants to avoid all the women who come in the morning and some of the women that come back in the evening if they've run out of water to draw. She comes right in the middle of the day so she can avoid everybody. But watch what happens in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. Now Jesus, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. That's some Old Testament history there. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now watch what happens next. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, they have to understand something. This Samaritan woman did not expect to meet anybody. She came at that time because that's when nobody came. Jesus did expect to meet someone. And that's sometimes how God's new beginnings come. We're not always looking for it, not always aware. But Jesus shows up where we are and waits on us to see if we're willing to follow him into a new beginning. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, verse 7, Jesus said to her, will you do me a favor? Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, she said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a favor? How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate. Don't talk with Samaritans. Jesus answered her. These are some of those powerful words in the Bible when you understand what he's saying. Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, Jesus, if you knew who I was, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He says, you're astounded that I would ask you for a favor. When you get to know who I am, you'll ask me for life and water. Everything changes when you know Jesus. New beginnings. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. The well's deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And now Jesus then enters into this theological conversation with her. They talk about worship. They talk about what's the right place to worship. They talk about some of the history of the, the Samaritans and the Jewish people. And, they, and it's not all recorded here, but they, they go into this deep conversation. But a little bit later, in the midst of this conversation about worship and the right place to worship, we pick it up in verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain, not on your place of worship, neither on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem, the Jewish place of worship. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. It comes through the line of the Jewish people, through Jesus. Yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God's looking for worshipers that will worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Now watch this. The woman said, I know that Messiah, the one called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Now watch Jesus' response. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. She says, when the Messiah, the Savior of the world, shows up, he'll make everything clear. And then Jesus, sort of almost in three ways, says, he, says, he says, to her, says to her, I, the one speaking to you. When you say I, you realize that it's the person speaking to you because you're I, right? But he says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. In case you don't get it, I'm going to say it almost three different ways. I, the one you're talking to, I am he. Did you get it? What happens next is staggering. She's transformed. She runs back into the town. And you know what she tells people back in the town? The, all the people she'd been avoiding? All the people that knew that she had been married and it didn't work out, and married and it didn't work out, and married again and it didn't work out, and married again and it didn't work out, and married again and it didn't work out, and now she's shacking up with a guy. Everybody who knew her, the people she was avoiding by coming in the middle of the day, she goes back and she tells them, come see a man who told me everything about me. He told me everything I've ever done. What is she saying? Come meet somebody who knows everything about me and he still loves me. Could this be our Messiah, the one we're waiting for? She's telling them, she's saying, I know it is, but I want you to ask the question, could this be the Messiah? She was changed. What a new beginning. That's a new beginning. You meet Jesus. And so, so Jesus' arrival, his incarnation, then comes into our lives when we recognize that Jesus has arrived. There's the inspiration of when you came to faith in Jesus, whether it was 10 years ago or 50 years ago or Christmas Eve this year. When you put your faith in Jesus, he arrives, he shows up, and he gives new beginnings, and everything changes. So I want to just think about some of the ways that this woman's life was transformed through the new beginning of Jesus and ask you to think, maybe Jesus wants a new beginning in my life in that way too. Maybe Jesus wants to continue transforming me to be more who he wants me to be. So what's new? Well, there's new norms in verses four through nine of this passage in relationships and in boundaries. What do I mean new norms in relationships and boundaries? This woman knew that Jewish rabbis didn't talk to Samaritan women. This woman knew that. And Jesus says, you don't know who I am. I blow up all those I can't talk to someone like you attitudes. Jesus blows up all of the our people don't relate with your people outlooks. He blows it up. A new way of seeing relationships. Man, when Jesus saw a person with leprosy and every other person would say to that person, don't touch me, stay away from me. Jesus reached out and touched them. He blows up all the stuff that separate us. And if you walk in the newness of Jesus, you don't look at people as their outward appearance or this or that group. That doesn't matter. These are people that God loves, and you love them right where they're at. That's what we do. Why? Because we've been transformed by the new power of Jesus in us. Amen? That's how we live. That's who we are. And then new understanding of God. This woman gives a whole new understanding. You know, she says, you as a rabbi would never ask me as a Samaritan woman to draw you water. And Jesus says, oh, no, no, you don't even understand. You don't even get it. When you get to know who I am, you come to me and ask me to give you life, water that lasts forever. That's who I am. She couldn't even comprehend it. What's your view of God? Always mad at me. Always disappointed with me. Always pushing me away. If you knew him, when you really know him, you run to his arms and you say, fill me with your living water. Overflow through me to others. See, we don't hide from God because we're unworthy. We come to God because we know we are unworthy. Get it? We know that only by his grace are we saved. And he gives us a whole new outlook on faith and who he is. And then new refreshment and satisfaction. In verses 13 to 14. She's wanting enough water for one more day. He says, I'm going to give you water forever. It's better it's better. She said, where can I find this percolating water that never runs out? And Jesus says, you're looking at him. 
And if you put your faith in Jesus, you know the refreshment he brings and the hope he brings through all the dry times of life. New worship. New worship. Jesus has this conversation with this woman. And she says, and they've been debating because the Samaritans said the right place to worship is Mount Gerizim. And the Jews said the right place to worship is Mount Zion. And Jesus said, eh, neither. For a Jewish rabbi to say it's not about Jerusalem, you get in a lot of trouble from the school of rabbis on that one. They thought it was all about Jerusalem. But Jesus says the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So whether you're at home online, out in the courtyard, in the family worship venue, or here in the worship center, if you're worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth, he will draw near you. And you can fully worship him wherever you are. So continue to worship him everywhere all the time. And then new faith. In this encounter with Jesus, she realizes that this is the Messiah. And she puts her faith in him. She follows him. She seeks him. And she becomes a follower of Jesus so much so, and what you don't see in the passage here is, is what happens is she, she believes he's the Messiah and then she goes to a four-month outreach sharing your faith training class and then she runs into town and tells everybody she met Jesus, right? No! No training. No classes. Now, I'm big on training. I'm big on classes. I'm big on equipping. I, I, you know, Sharon and I developed resources for this. But here, she meets Jesus. She feels his love. She sees that he's cleansed her. He's the Messiah. So she doesn't take the next four months getting... Some of you are still waiting to talk about your faith with other people until you're equipped and trained and feel ready to go. She just went, I'm running back to town. And you know what happened? Some of the people in the town became followers of Jesus before they even came out and met him. Why? Her testimony, her story. Your story of a changed life has power. You can share that with people. Then she gets everyone to come out to see Jesus. And a bunch of them start believing in him because they've met him. Then he hangs around for a couple more days and they kind of have like revival meetings and he just is, they're bringing people to come and meet Jesus. God is waiting to do new things. And so, so the incarnation, Jesus comes among us, the new beginning. When you become a Christian, the inspiration that he gives you a new beginning in your life and if you are a Christian, you have new life and no one can take that away from you. And if you're not a Christian yet, if you receive Jesus, he will give you new life. But it doesn't end there. Then there's the illustration that we go into the world and we show people that new beginnings are possible. And our world needs to know that there is hope. Our world needs to know that there's new beginnings. Grade school kids and high school kids and college young people and adults and senior citizens that don't know Jesus, they need to know that there's a God who loves them and he has something planned for their lives. And so when we walk into any room, Jesus comes with us. The arrival of Jesus offers salvation, hope, life, and a completely new beginning for every human being. If you will receive his grace, he will give you new life. So you can carry that everywhere you go. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what we're going to focus on for the next eight weeks as a congregation. What does it mean to walk with Jesus, to follow Jesus? Here's Shoreline's mission statement. And it was our mission statement before I became the pastor. And we haven't changed it because it's simple, it's clear, and it's effective. Here it is, our mission statement. To help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. As many people as possible, we keep reaching out, totally committed, we become disciples that are deeply committed to Jesus. That's our calling. And we're gonna keep being the church until everyone knows Jesus or until Jesus returns. But we're gonna keep being the church he's called us to be. That's why we're spending the next eight weeks digging into this, thinking about this together, talking about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus who knows him, who loves him, and who then walks with him into the world and shares his love. And so then, as you continue on in John chapter 4, you see these other new things that unfold. There, there's, there's a new th- view of who you are. When you walk with Jesus, you have a new view of who you are. This woman says, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. If you live your life in shame, if you live your life in guilt, if you live your life always just beating yourself up, understand that Jesus knows everything you've ever done. And the Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's not waiting for you to clean yourself up. He's not waiting for you to prove yourself. There's no point where you say, where you come to God and you say, okay, God, I spent the last four years, I I don't cuss nearly as much as I used to, I I don't steal like I used to, I'm I'm starting to even read the Bible, even though I'm not sure what it means, and I'm living such a good life. God, I pulled my life together, I'm all clean, I'm I'm all good, so God, you're lucky to have me, here I am, I've got it all together, right? That's not how it it starts. We come as we are. 
In the old Billy Graham Crusades, there was a song they sung almost every crusade as people would come forward to receive Jesus. It was called Just As I Am. And the words were something like this, Just as I am, without one plea, but thou, my God, hast died for me. I don't come except I say, Jesus, you died for me. We don't come to God and say, here's how good I am. We come and say, Jesus, here's how good you were. I accept your grace. That's the invitation, a whole new view of who we are. I'm broken, I'm sinful, and God loves me anyways. A new theology of a messianic message. Jesus says, I, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. Don't wait any longer. The Messiah has come. The Savior is here. We can receive him. He gives us new beginnings, a new story to tell. And this woman begins to tell her story. Her story is only this long. It's only a, a few sentences. I just met this guy at the well. He's the Messiah. We had a great conversation about worship and about where to worship and all these things, but I've met him and I believe he's the Messiah. You have a story to tell. God's at work in your life. If you're a Christian, God is at work in your life. Sherry and I often talk about this. You can talk about how God's presence in your life, God's power in your life, and God's provision in your life. How has God been present with you? How has God been powerful and helped you through? How has God provided for you? Tell those stories to people that don't know Jesus. They will be compelled. They'll be drawn in to want to know if this God could also be there for them in the way that he's there for you. A new family, verses 40 and 41. There's this new family that just that begins to unfold. This woman is now invited in to the family of Jesus, to the family of God. I grew up in a home with about 80 to 100 extended family members, of which one was a Christian. My dad's mom, my granny, that was it. And then my sister Gretchen became a Christian. Then I became a Christian. Eventually, all five of the kids in my family of birth became Christians. Three of us are in different kinds of ministry. God's beginning to work in my family. But when I first became a Christian, my only real family of God was the church. And so I just became part of the church. And I was like, here's this family. This is one of the reasons why we need to be together. Because we're a family. We need each other. Even when we don't think we need each other. We need so there's this new family that we become part of. And then a new destination. Verse 42. And just that assurance that God has an eternal plan for us. A place that Jesus is preparing for us. So here's the final thought. As we enter a new year, maybe our resolutions should be bigger than we dare to dream. If you made resolutions, fantastic. If you still haven't given up on them two days in, great. If you make it past January 19th, more power to you. If you carry all year long, wonderful. But make sure that the new beginnings you're thinking about are deeper and richer than you would probably come up with on your own. What if we, what if we said this? In 2022, I want to know Jesus more than I've ever known him before. I want to love him with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. I want to live for him and be his person. If you decide that's what you want, man, then we, we are going to have a great year together. And I'm going to challenge you over the next eight weeks to be here, be fully engaged, and say, Lord, I want to go deeper in my faith than I've ever gone before. And if you're not yet a Christian, uh, would you, if you're not yet a Christian, would you just say, God, I don't even know if this is all real, and I don't understand the whole Jesus thing totally yet, but I'm going to be here for these next eight weeks and open my heart. And if you come with an open heart, I believe you'll encounter Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the giver of new beginnings. In this crazy world with so much discouragement, would you breathe hope into our hearts? Would you remind us that you are the one who offers new beginnings every moment of every day, any time. And Lord, I want to pray for any person right now who is feeling discouraged, who has stumbled, who's fallen, who's made a bad choice, and they put their faith in you, but right now they're waiting for some, some moment when they can be good enough and sort of earn their way back into your favor. Will you remind them that your grace is sufficient, that the price you paid on the Christ cross was enough, and will you let them today just say, God, begin a new beginning right now, today. Let me step up and follow you in a fresh new way. And Lord God, lead us on this journey over these next eight weeks of discovering what it means to walk with you in deeper ways than we ever have before, to become more like Jesus, to take your hand, Lord, and, and become who you want us to be, but then to go with you where you go, to share with this world this good news of Jesus. Bless us in this new year with new beginnings. 
and help us become more and more like you each step of the way through the 2022. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before I ask you to stand up and give you, send you off with a word of blessing, a uh, couple quick things. If you need prayer, if you're online, just, te- uh, just email your prayer need to the email address you see or call the number you see. Someone will answer their phone and pray with you right now. Here on campus, come in the worship center. And we had people, we got people over here. And we got folks, so anybody up front here, they're ready to pray with you. And excited and, and honored to do that. If you're new at Shoreline, if you're online and you're new, just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen and we will send you a digital connection card and get to know you online the best we can. And as soon as you're ready, come join us on campus. If you're on campus and you're new, just go by the Connection Center and they want to give you a little gift bag and give you a personal welcome and thank you for coming and answer your questions. This Wednesday night is Night of Worship. Uh, Pastor Sean felt a call to be go, leave the military at some point and be going to ministry. I'm not saying that's going to happen to you if you come tonight to worship, but I will say this, God will show up in a great and powerful way. We're going to have communion together, first, first communion of the new year, and so join us if you're online. Be ready online or come join us on campus, 615 this Wednesday, night of worship. And then, uh, and then finally, I want to challenge you on your way out. Uh, if you're going to jump into these next eight weeks with us, go right to the Connection Center, go to the book table, get a book, jump in, go outdoors, sign up for a small group. If, you, if you're willing to do that and give that a try for eight weeks and just say, I'm going to give this the best I can to be part of this. And so just jump in these next two weeks and really, I mean, these next eight weeks and grow together. I invite you to stand with me. If you're at home, feel free to stand where you are there if you're able. Uh, family worship venue outdoors and here in the worship center, let's stand together and just receive these words of blessing as you go from here. As you walk into this new year, will you walk into this year with an anticipation that God is ready and excited to bring new beginnings? Keep your heart open. Notice God's presence. Like the woman at the well who came at noon to avoid everybody and met Jesus, may Jesus surprise you with his presence, speak to you by his spirit, and give new beginnings that will surprise you and transform your life and make you more like him. God bless you. Have a great next couple days. We'll see you Wednesday night of worship and then next Sunday for worship. God bless you. Have a great day.